more keynote as we continue on tonight. And so we've heard from Ava about this idea of healthy urban living and, and what that can look like. And you'll hear from someone else in terms of what that looks like with regard to social impact as well. And I'm excited to invite up to the stage a gentleman who is no stranger to the fabrication environment. He has done a number of amazing projects from Fab Lab Amsterdam to an open source restaurant called Instructables Restaurant. And he and his work are rooted in the belief that people and products and the relationship between the two need to change. And so his passion for that is really centered around how open design principles can re-engage people if we give them the tools to do so. So I'm very excited for you all to hear from him tonight. And that inspiration behind his work has led he and his team to create the first fairly designed smartphone. So please join me in welcoming with the same immense energy that you gave for Ava, Mr. Bas Van Abel, founder and CEO of Fairphone. Well, thank you. Um, it is getting hot. And I, I'm, I am going to take out that, that sweater you were talking about. Um, so <coughs> let, me, let me start with this. Uh, a while back, I was reading a report from Vodafone. And in that report, it, it turned out that one out of three people actually picks up their phone when they're having sex. And that's pretty scary. You can imagine that if one out of three people picks up the phone when having sex, what that says about our relationship between phones and people. And I'm not sure if, uh, if anyone here is suffering from nom nomophobia. Is there anyone here in the audience suffering from nomophobia? Another research actually shows that more than 50% of the people are suffering from nomophobia. And if you, you know, if you, if you ask yourself, what is, more, no, what is nomophobia? Nomophobia is the feeling you get when you wake up and you go to work, and then all of a sudden you go, like, oh shit, oh shit, no, no, I forgot my phone. So you're stuck, you're disconnected from your social life, you're disconnected from everything. So nomophobia is no mobile phone phobia. And we all suffer from that. I, I'm sure that we all know that feeling. So, I, you know, I, I can go on and on about, uh, you know, trivia about phones and people. Uh, uh, you know, there's anxiety, for example. Anxiety is that feeling when you get, when you, when you think your phone is ringing, but it's not actually ringing. It's like, oh, was that my phone? Oh, no, shit, that was just, you know, someone, you know, passing by or something. So we have an intimate relationship with our phone. But there's also something really strange going on, because what do we know about our phones? Who made them? You know, where do they come from? What goes into these phones? Where do they end up if we don't use them anymore? Did you know that there's more than 1,500 components that go into a phone? 1,500 components that are made by factories all around the world. And these factories, they get resources, minerals, from all around the world, mines all around the world. And if you, if you think about it, and I, you know, for the people that don't have the phones in their hands already, maybe you just you know, pick, you know, hold that phone in your hand, just, just look at it, weigh it, just look at it, just pick, pick up the phone, because there's is, this is, this is something fascinating about that phone, if you think about it. What you're holding in your hand is, well, you, well, you, can, you can also drop it, but <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that, but if you hold it in your hand, just feel that phone in your hand, and what you're holding there is basically stuff that comes from the ground. You know, it's, it's, it's minerals, it's mud and rocks that we took from the ground and that with our fantastic economic system, we are able to actually make that into a product. And there's, you know, the whole world is involved in making that into that tiny product you're holding in your hand. And that's something we, you know, we, we tend to forget, that everything we use, everything you see around you, everything we eat, Everything comes from the ground or it grows on the ground. So how does that work for phones? This is a, a, a rock, a piece of stone I took from a mine in eastern Congo. 
and this is coltan. Coltan has been used for phones to make them thinner. And in, in Eastern Congo, is, you know, it's, it's mined among, uh, uh, in, in, in several places around the world, but among them, Eastern Congo. In Eastern Congo, there's guys uh, digging holes 60 meter deep under the ground to get these minerals out of the ground so we can have thinner phones. And that, that kind of looks like this. They're risking their own lives to get that done. And there's something else going on in Eastern Congo. There's a conflict going on in Eastern Congo for the last 10, 15 years where mil millions of people have died in conflicts related to the mining of the minerals we use in our phones. So then these phones, you know, then these, these minerals are being used to make components. And these components are made in factories among, you know, factories like this. But people work seven days a week, 12, days, you know, uh, 12 hours a day for not that much money. And then the phone comes together. And you know what? It's a black box. We can't even open the phone. We can't repair it. So we don't have to repair it, and we don't have to open it, because we use it for two years, and then we, you know, we want to have a new phone. So why change the battery, you would say? Yeah, so there's no use in that. So then the phones end up somewhere uh, in Ghana, for example, in dumps like this, uh, the phones we don't use anymore. A lot of our electronic waste actually ends up in the dumps uh, in, in developing countries, where they don't have the proper stuff to recycle them. You know, they can't open the phone, so what they do is they burn it. They burn it so they can get the minerals out of it. Because those minerals are still worth something, and you can use them. So. The question is, you know, do we want this? And I think the obvious answer is, of course we don't want this. But there's a more important question to this, is what can we do about it? You know, where can we start? What is the real problem here? And you know, what kind of solutions can we come up with? And these were the questions we had when we started Fairphone a couple of years back. We were thinking about how do we get this story of what is behind our products, behind our mobile phones, behind these electronics we use every day, all the way to the consumer. And you know, if we do that, you know, what, what are the solutions? And we didn't even know the exact problems, because it's, uh, you know, it's the whole world we're talking about here. I just showed you. It's just one mineral I was talking about. So my background is in design. Uh, I'm a designer. But I also have, uh, have a background in technology. So for me. Things are a bit simple, I would say. You know, you, for me, making change can be as easy as making a product. And I really believe that through making stuff, you can change things. Because a product is tangible, and it can be a starting point to really look into the whole world behind it. Yeah, you can unfold and you can open up systems by starting with the products we use every day. So that's what we said. Why don't we make a phone? And if we make a phone, we go through that whole supply chain st step by step, and we'll find out how things are and why they are like this. And maybe we can understand them. And if we understand them, well, we can change them. We can find solutions. But you know, if, you <laughs> if you make a phone, and what we wanted to do is really become part of the economic system itself, you need customers. So the next thing we did when we found out a way to, you know, to really make this phone, go into the mines, was find customers. And we set up a crowdfunding. In 2013, we did a crowdfunding. We raised 7.5 seven million euros in a couple of months, uh, which really showed that people were, uh, were ready for it. People bought a phone that didn't exist. 25,000 people, 7.5 million euro, and, well, we didn't really make, you know, know at that point how to make a phone, but at least we, you know, we knew a mine and we knew a factory and we knew we wanted to, uh, wanted to get there. But it was a real good start. And we made 60,000 phones, and all these phones we sold. Fairphone 1 wasn't a particularly, you know, it was a good phone, but it wasn't a special phone. It wasn't designed by us. So we really focused on the supply chain, we focused on the materials, but where we really started you know, designing our own phone was when we did our second crowdfunding. We raised 10 million euros last year, and that made it possible for us to really make Fairphone 2. And Fairphone 2 
like I said, is designed from scratch. Is there anyone here in the audience that ever has you know, replaced his own battery of the phone? There's quite some people, I guess. Probably come to see us only, but yeah, so you, you change the battery. Is there anyone here who actually, let me put this down, who actually not just changed the battery, but also uh, changed the screen of the phone? Yeah, so that is great. How, how long did it take you? Half an hour. So you see, a lot of phones actually have batteries glued to the inside. You can't even open them. And you, you probably you know, you know, you know a, bit, a bit about technology. Yeah, see? So you're not afraid to open up stuff. But a lot of people are afraid to open up stuff. So at Fairphone, we think it's really important that you can actually repair your own stuff. And more importantly, that you can open up your own stuff, dive into the technology. And why? Because we want people to use their product longer. Because if you use your products longer, you need to make less phones. And of course, you need to make a very you know, solid phone that doesn't break and blah, blah, blah. But we all know that phones do break at a certain point, And you do want to get uh, a replacement for that. So we made a phone that is modular. Um, you can, I can show you a picture of it. And all these modules you can replace yourself. So anyone, you don't need any technological uh, uh, knowledge. You can just, uh, you know, with a screwdriver, you can just take out the parts and replace them. And it's not only the replacing of it that is important, because, like I said, the making an open system, I think, is the most important thing. Because we can make phones that last for a long time, but if people don't want to use that phone for a long time, it's, you know, it doesn't make sense. So one of the most important things for me is if you can't open it, you don't own it. It's about ownership. And I think a lot of people here know that. You, know, you want to dive into these systems. You want to engage with these systems. So what we do is, uh, you know, next to being able to open up the hardware, repair your device, uh, we offer open source software where you can actually download all the, uh, the, the built environment and you can download the whole binaries and libraries to be able to build your own Android software, which we use for the, for the phone. Um, if you feel like it, you can go to the website and uh, check it out. The good thing about open sourcing things is that people, your know, communities, start engaging also with your product. So now we have a Fairphone where we have uh, several operating systems running on it. So we have a, a Fairphone where Sailfish is running on it. You see you know, that one. This one, you have a Fairphone running Firefox OS. We have a Fairphone running uh, uh, Android with uh, the Google services. And you have an, uh, a stock Android running. So what we were able to do is to involve communities in developing the software for the phone as well. It's also an important element to keep the phone longer because you can make some of the, you know, the hardware, you know, you can, you can make the hardware uh, repairable, but uh, of course the, f the software needs to be updated as well. So there's another thing that we added, and that is an uh, extension port. An extension port is, uh, you know, it's, not, it's nothing more than a USB port, but we put it on the back so people can actually develop their own hardware on it. So we, you know, we, we uh, release the CAT files so people can make intelligent, case, intelligent cases on top of the Fairphone where they uh, put, for example, this is uh, hardware encryption so you can make the, the phone more secure. Um, here you see a 3D printed case with, uh, uh, I think it's an embedded LED. Anyway, you can, you, know, you can think about solutions yourself on how to do that. But like I said, there's more to the phone than the phone itself. There's that, there's that whole supply chain behind it. So for us, it's really important to look at, the, you know, look, look at these things in a holistic way. We have projects and mines in Congo, in Rwanda, and also in, uh, in South America, where we get fair trade gold all the way from Peruvian mines uh, into the phone through, uh, uh, well, you see it here, through Switzerland and then Hong Kong import and then it goes you know, to our factory. It's, it's quite a lot of work to actually get that into the supply chain. And we're the first one, the first electronics company that actually has uh, a fair trade gold incorporated in the supply chain. Here you see it, it's, uh, it's on the PCB. We have worker programs in the factories in China 
where we have welfare programs where we put premiums on top of the phone, where people pay an extra, and these extras go into a fund where there's a democratic elected representation system uh, deciding where that money is going to be, be spent on. We took back more phones than we actually produced, especially in Ghana, where you know, a lot of these phones end up uh, on the landfills. And these phones we got back, we, uh, we, we uh, got the minerals back uh, in, uh, in Belgium, and these minerals are being used to produce new products again as well. So we're the full circle. So we still, have a, you know, we still have a lot to do. We still have so many things to do. But by making this phone, we started the movement of people that really, really want to create that change. And you know, next time you, you keep something in your hand or you, you're, you're behind your computer, you look at your pixels and you look at the bytes, or you use the bytes or you send files, just think about it that behind that bits and bytes and pixels you see, there's a whole world of mines, factories, distribution systems, recycling facilities that are needed to make that possible. And I think we need to open those systems. Now, we can open source products all the way to the software, but I think we need to go further to the supply chains and really go into that source of where things come from and how it's, you know, how it's organized. Because I think if you open up things, you're able to understand things. If you're able to understand things, you're able to change them. And then it doesn't matter how complex they are. Thank you very much.